Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm Virginia Shearer from the High Museum. I'm the Associate Director of uh, Education here at the High and in charge of public programming. So I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it's our pleasure to uh, work with the Atlanta Contemporary Arts Center um, a few times a year um, to collaborate on um, some really pretty wonderful programming. Um, we're going to flash up the Atlanta Contemporary art slide, give them a big shout out. Uh, there you go. That's right. So um, it's my honor to introduce Stuart Herodner, who I'm sure needs no introduction to all of us among this group who are big fans, but he's the executive director and tireless individual who makes things happen along with his team of Saskia and Stacy. So um, introducing Stuart now, he and Ron are going to come up and have a good talk with you all. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm getting a piece of paper from over here that I need. So forgive me. Okay. okay, so I wanna, is that working? Yes. I do wanna thank Virginia and uh, Michael Rooks, who is not here with us tonight, and all the folks at the High Museum for continuing to let us uh, develop programs that take place here. Uh, I just want to try to put tonight's uh, talk in context. Many of you have in your hands a handout which tells you that this talk tonight with Ronald Feldman is part of a series that we've just launched at our center called Contemporary Talks, and it's a series of keynote lectures or conversations with people that I think are not only doing some of the most dynamic work in their fields, and their fields include uh, curatorial work, gallery di directors and dealers, uh, architects, poets and critics, and, and working artists, but this is really a group of people whose activities in their in their field have really changed the way those fields operate. And so we really encourage you to see as many of these talks as you can. As you know, a lot of these talks help us try to continue our mission to not only show amazing and significant artworks, but try to put those artworks into context and try to bring people to Atlanta who might not necessarily come through our city and share the kind of experiences that they have. So, it's with, it's with uh, great pleasure that I can tell you I started to, as a very young artist in New York, making my way through Soho looking at exhibitions, came upon in 1981 the Ronald Feldman Fine Arts Gallery. And when we, we refer to Ron, Ronald or Ron all night today, but the, the person who needs to be mentioned significantly here is Ron's wife, Freda, who has been from the beginning of this gallery his collaborator and partner, and she's not with us, but. Um, that, that duo is really something that needs to be acknowledged. Um, what we thought we could do tonight is really chew on ideas about what having a gallery means, what artist relationships are like, and in the case of uh, Ron Feldman, these artist relationships we're talking about are with people who in the early 70s and moving through the 80s and now, you know, in terms of four decades of work, have become some of the most well-known artists in the contemporary arena. And so we'll let uh, him talk about that. But we're gonna talk about some particular people, what it takes to do this kind of work, what the benefits are of this work, and then we'll take some questions and hopefully open up a real discussion about uh, what gallery work is like. And I would say there really is no gallery, I mean, quite like Ronald Feldman's gallery, really. Uh, I used the word legendary, and I meant it. There is not uh, a gallery I can think of historically or working right now that has spent as much time cultivating complicated art, art that is not always immediately understood or liked or thought of as many of the things that people want out of their art viewing, beauty, and immediate satisfaction. This is art that needs to be chewed on over time and delivers in some pretty powerful ways. 
And so when you see the range of work he's supported over the years, I think you'll understand what I mean when I say it takes an enormous amount of effort and uh, intelligence to pull this kind of effort off. So without further ado, I would like to just welcome Ronald Feldman, give him a Southern hospitality uh, welcome. And I think we should stop now. I don't think I'll get any better than that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so if we're speaking into these lapel mics, that all works? Okay. Okay. What I should say from the outset is that while we've known each other in one way or another for a few decades, we don't know each other well. I know most of Ron's work from being a visitor to this gallery. And so we've not prepared. I haven't, we haven't done a version of this talk in the bar or over lunch. We, I don't know what he's going to answer. And so part of the plan, he doesn't know what I'm going to ask. So part of the pleasure is really we're going to wing it and try to get at some real content. And we do have a couple of images that I think we would probably uh, want to start with. that working right? No, we're back to Salvador Daliville. Am I going? What am I doing? Remember, you're going to go backwards. OK. That's counterintuitive. OK. What I first wanted to ask you, I mean, regardless of the image that's up here, is you, you, you opened a gallery after a year of working as partner in a law firm. You became partner in a law firm and yeah. almost immediately decided you didn't want to do that. How did that, how, well, how did that happen? I worked my way up to partner in about two years or something. And after three years, I decided it wasn't for me. I, um, I wasn't a protagonist for things that were that interesting for me. And being an expert in a particular field of law, once I had a case or two, I never wanted to see the third case. Um, it was just my nature. And um, uh, I, because I lived in New York and we didn't have children, at that time, um, we could spend our weekends going to galleries, uh, to museums. Uh, asking questions in galleries and so on, and I realized that I needed something that I would be the protagonist for in a different way than I would be for a, a legal client. Um, and I wanted to take great risks that way as well. I started to learn. Um, I slept through Doric and Ionic columns in college, and um, now all of a sudden I realized that art was rich that it had a long history that really was relevant to this age as well, and that the challenge would then be to find artists that would make statements at this time that we would look back on historically and see that they had a keen vision and invented styles of working that were relevant and important to not only this generation, but to later generations as well. Um, so I would say that in making the choices of artists that I wanted to show, I always had that in the back of my head. Um, if I was going to do this and risk everything, and it was a great risk, we were bankrupt on paper at least many times over these years, um, then it had to be worthwhile. And so that was a guess, and that's where individual personality comes into it. There are a lot of art dealers. I, I respect my colleagues very much, but it's competitive in a certain extent. And um, everyone is choosing artists and showing their work. And um, there are a lot of people out there who then critique and make decisions, collectors, museums, curators. Um, and I always felt that it was important that if you were going to do this, that you have picked artists that no matter what it looked like, no matter how difficult it was, in the long term, looking back on it, it would be relevant to its time. And that was still looking at young artists today and, and, and questioning them about what they're doing, it's the same thing that's in my head. It never really changes. And 
I am prepared. I was always prepared then. I didn't realize how monetarily it was uh, going to be really dangerous to do this in life. But I'm not waiting for the immediate reaction that the public will say they love it. I really would probably drop an artist who got their first show with rave reviews in my gallery. I'd be nervous it was the wrong direction. It would have been too simple. I know that sounds crazy, and I'm teasing a little bit, but still, um, it just indicates that if you're going to do this this way and play for keeps, for history, you're going to be taking risks, and you're not going to worry about bad reviews, that as long as you're getting fed by the artist something that's worthwhile in your life, then, in fact, you want to stay with it. Um, and I think that artists appreciate that. It's a, it's a rough thing to represent artists. You're their voice in the world to a certain extent. They're counting on you to sell their work. So even though you would think it's difficult work to buy and own right away, and I recognize that it is, they don't necessarily recognize that. So there's always this worry that the artist is not making a living, uh, and uh, it's always on your shoulders as to what you can do to sell the work that you know at the moment is unsaleable. Um, so that's, that's something very hard to balance. In a, there's a great book that came out in the early 80s. It's called The Art Dealers. And in it, several prominent dealers talk about their origins, how they got involved in this. And I was looking at it. It's been on my shelf for a long time. I was looking at your, one of the things that you say in there, which is, I had no idea that running a gallery was a 24-hour-a-day job. And so I'm interested if you would talk a little bit about what do you think the skill set is to do this work? Um, uh, the skill set is um, the first skill set you need for many, many jobs, I think, in the world. And um, I needed a little bit in law. I probably would have liked it better if I needed to use the skill set more. Is being street smart. I really think there's something about being street smart that you know what you're up against, you have a sense that this is a survival mode. You're going to have to live in it. You're going to have to be very inventive. Um, and you hope that you can then um, su succeed in lasting long enough that the artist will have a fair hearing in, in, the, in the arts community and in the real world. Um, so for me, that's really what it, what it has always meant uh, that way. And the other skill set, um, to go to the most important thing that you would need is the faith that what you're doing is worth doing and that there's the possibility that the artists you're working with, this is, from, this is from my point of view, I'm sure artists are thinking the same thing, that their work will eventually be accepted as important within the canon of art history. Um, and you never know the answer to that. It's always a guessing game. You're not certain. So what it takes is a projection. Not the first show, not the second show, not the third show necessarily, but you, you can see that because of the subject matter and the aesthetic of a particular artist, that in the future, when we look back and as we get a grasp of what's actually happening today, which is hard always to know or see, that the artist will look like they invented a way to show it to the world. And it's always hard to see yourself in the very beginning when everything is happening. You don't want to see the Vietnam War in a canvas while it's being fought. There's a lot of things you don't want to know. No one wanted to see Picasso's Guernica at the time that he made it, because it's too difficult. But as you look back in history, you see that the artists that really are the ones that we pay a lot of attention to and we reveal most took the biggest risks, challenged, their own critique, their own society, culture, world that, that, that they were in at that time and gave it back many times in a harsh way. Somehow, if you look back at the Impressionists, we all, it's all become decorative. But I can assure you that if you put another mindset um, into, into your thinking and you look at the Impressionists and find out how difficult it was for them in their lifetimes, um, for their work to be accepted. They weren't even allowed to show in certain places. That still goes on. We think because there's maybe five or 10 hot artists in the world and they're making fortunes, that it's easy, everyone understands it, and so on. But really, it's almost a tortoise and the hare. 
You know, the hare's out there running and jumping and everything else, and, but the tortoise is moving along just as well. And there's, there's no way to say that that's the best and only model. But um, if you're steady with your work, if you don't compromise it in any way, um, then the chances of this finally getting a hearing is good. It's, it's a rough road to be a contemporary artist, and it always was. The history of art tells us this. The stories of artists' lives are fascinating, unbelievable, really. Um, but when we understand what they've done, we go, wow, this was genius, this was incredible. Did they think of themselves as genius at the time? Probably not. I think thinking of yourself that way makes your work look a little bit sort of stylized. Um, it's not that. It's a spark inside you that just propels you to do it. I have a bunch of questions, but we want to go back and forth to be able to talk a little bit about some of, I mean, we've picked a selection of people and any number of the images that we're going to show today, Ron could talk for hours about, so we, we're trying to do a, a difficult task. But since you talked just a second ago about artists whose uh, output and whose ideas become understood as significant for the time that they were operating, I mean, it's almost perfect that we, we have, you know, the patron saint of seemingly any number of things on the wall above us here with, with Andy Warhol. Can you talk a little bit about, by the time you became involved with Warhol in, a lot, in many ways, and, and the show that is, is up right now at the gallery is a show uh, called Warhol's Andes. So now, even after many years of having worked with Andy when he was alive, and, and, and obviously now that he's gone, um, can you talk a little bit about your involvement with Warhol, how, how that developed, and tell us a little bit about this very enigmatic person? Uh, well, it's, um, life has a lot of luck in it. And um, the space that we took uh, for our first gallery was uh, basically abandoned space around the corner from the Whitney Museum. And it was a space that Andy um, eventually showed his soup can boxes and everything else. First he showed it in a gallery called, in a stable, really a horse stable. And now this gallery was called the Stable Gallery. It was no longer a horse stable. It was uh, around the corner from the Whitney. It had been boarded up. It smelled from cat urine. Um, and um, <laughs> we leased it. And um, not realizing that uh, we knew it was a good location uptown. It wasn't downtown. Downtown was just really barely developing. And Andy would come to see the shows with his little ducks and, uh, ducks and uh, dog, uh, Archie. And um, Archie and Andy would just come in every Saturday and we'd chat and chat. And um, we got to like each other and sort of understand each other. And um, uh, we never had a business relationship in the, early, in the first few years. And then this was in the 70s, mid 70s. Um, and then he started to ask me the weirdest thing. He said, do you have any ideas for me? And I said, what does he mean by ideas? What, what kind of ideas could I have for Andy? So he's, he kept asking, do you have any ideas? And I thought, this is the weirdest thing. So of course, I never gave many ideas. This went on for quite a while. Then I realized I was going to lose my friendship with Andy if I didn't give him an idea. And so he came one day and... Um, I said, well, I have an idea. And um, he said, what is it? I said, well, how about 10 presidents of the United States? And he says, gee, gosh, Ron, that's nice. But he didn't say, gee, gosh, that's great. So I knew he was a loser. And um, <laughs> I found out immediately that Andy was a great shopper for ideas. And then I found out many, many years later that Andy asked everyone for ideas delivery people, and he just asked him for ideas. If he thought they might give him an idea, he wanted to know what was going on. And um, uh, finally, I realized that we had to come up with something that he might want to do. And um, uh, I did one day, and I called the, um, uh, his, he called the studio, and um, uh, Fred Hughes was there. He answered the phone. He was Andy's advisor. And I said, I have an idea for Andy. It'll give him a chance to make uh, portraits of really famous people, and I'd like to try this, and uh, let's see if this would work. So he said, what is it, Ron? I said, 10 portraits of Jews of the 20th century. I said, may not be for everybody, but these are the names. And I read off a list of names. Top of the list was Marx, who we didn't realize had died before the turn of the century. Um, and um, 
Freud was there, that, that could work, and, um, and Einstein. And we had a, a list of more. And so Fred yells across the fa uh, th through the factory, and his uh, studio was called the factory, and he yells out, hey, Andy, it's Ron Feldman. He wants, no, if you want to do 10 portraits of Jews of the 20th century. <laughs> and Andy yells back, Jewish geniuses, okay, who are they? <laughs> so um, he read out the names, and that started the process of calling this list, adding new names, and, and doing a project with Andy, and we started totally cold and blind. We had never done an addition, um, and it was uncertain if this was a good idea. Many people warned me this was not a good thing to do, that it would sound commercial, would sound terrible, it might have a built-in audience that you were catering to, and I thought, no, I'm thinking of my children, eventually my grandchildren. This is something that would be really special to have in the world in some way. And it also gave Andy the opportunity to do portraits of basically dead people. He had done Marilyn, but very few other people who were no longer here. He understood that instantly. And that's why he wanted to do the portraits. And so um, we began that process. And, um, at one point, I realized this was getting to be really serious, and a friend of mine who was an older uh, man and a critic, Pierre Restani, um, uh, from Paris, who was a uh, Holocaust survivor, took me one night in New York. He was very proud. He had a, it was like an innocent person of a kind, but an incredibly deep thinker and a great critic. And he took me to the Playboy Club in New York. And we both got totally drunk. And coming out of the Playboy Club that night, in a cold winter night, we're coming down the steps, and he takes me aside, and he hugs me, and he puts his mouth in my ear. And he said, Ronald, don't do this project with the Jews. And I said, Pierre, what is the problem? He said, Jews should be seen, should not be seen. They should be like mist in the air. And I said to him, do you know, Pierre, what I'm thinking, and I thought about this, you lived through the Holocaust. Being Jewish was dangerous and terrible. And it will be that again, I'm sure, many times. But I live here, and I'm looking at this history differently. I didn't have your experience. And I feel that it is OK to do this project. Um, but um, it opened at the Jewish Museum, which was totally an accident. Um, and um, Hilton Kramer kept calling. Uh, he wanted to see it while it was being installed. It wasn't installed or lit. Andy was there, I was there, Fred Hughes was there, um, some other uh, people who worked with Andy, and we were hanging the whole museum. And they kept coming and saying, he wants to come and write a review. We said, we don't need him. He's going to write a bad review. He always writes bad reviews about Warhol. It doesn't matter what it is. Finally, the museum was so nervous, they insisted on it. He came, went away, and on... Um, Yom Kippur Eve, as everyone was getting on trains to leave the city and go home to their families early, the review arrived. And it opened with the following sentence. Of all the woes that have befallen the Jewish people in their long history, it cannot be said that this is the worst. <laughs> and, and since we had invested virtually every penny uh, that we had in the world, in this sight unseen uh, portfolio, um, that was pretty bad. I called a friend, a very young critic at the time, uh, and uh, Carrie Ricky, and I got her uh, at home, and I said, Carrie, I'm in real trouble here. Um, read this review. She said, I read it. So I said, what do you think? She said, I don't know, I didn't see it. I said, so I'd like you to go and see it. Should you want me to go and write you a good review? I said, Gary, I would never ask you to do that. Could you just go? If you write a bad review, I promise we'll still be friends. Just anything. So she goes, and her article, a week later, reads as follows. I entered the museum expecting that it would be absolutely commercial and terrible. But all, I'm paraphrasing that part. But all I saw were these eyes penetrating eyes looking at me, and I realized that Warhol captured the hearts and souls of these characters, of these, of these individuals. I went, huh. So, uh, 
that, that, that is that's the beginning of working with Warhol. I thought, well, that was to be the end of that. We're done. I had an idea. We did it and so on. No. He kept insisting and it goes on and on for ideas. Yeah, he, he was relentless for ideas. So we did. We did many projects and we ended up at the end owning co-copyrights with Warhol Foundation, with certain with Warhol's uh, studio in the beginning, of, of 1,200 images of Warhol's. So that means that if you do color variations of one image, let's say Einstein, in, in 15 colors, each one of those is, is, a, is a copyrightable uh, image. Um, some of the other people in that portfolio are people like Gertrude Stein and George Gershwin and some other amazing people. And you've yeah. gone on through the 80s primarily uh, with some other follow-up print projects with, with Andy myths and ads and endangered species and other things. But I fear that we must leave Andy. It was fun to work with Andy, I have to say. <laughs> it was just a lot of fun. Um, I'm just, I, we're not going to get a chance to talk about everything that's up here. There's just, not a, there's just no way. But no. By, by virtue of having selected a handful uh, with folks at the gallery, um, Maybe I'm just going to go through some of these, maybe. Okay, so Nancy Chun um, is an artist that you've showed several times. I, I included her in a project I did in San Francisco, uh, an artist who works very much. As you'll start to see in some of these people, uh, Pep on Osorio, you may want to speak a little bit to this, yes, just because uh, for people who have been in Atlanta for a long time, Pep on showed work at this museum. Yes, I, these are not selected so that we would stop and I would talk about all these works. We just intended to be faster, but this is a good rhythm to think about it and to look at these works. Pepona Sario um, was living in the, uh, in the Bronx, in the South Bronx. Where I, I was born and lived in that area uh, when I was very little. And um, I saw a work of his at the Whitney, uh, Whitney uh, Annual, and I called him. And uh, he hadn't been downtown very much, and, uh, but was, I could tell on the phone he was amazing. And we started to work together uh, with installations. So what you're seeing now, he was a teacher at one point in his life. He was a, a sociologist as well. And um, he, in this particular work, is looking into the problem within the Hispanic community, which is his community. And he was very disturbed with how the families have been broken up and the difficulties that they had. So here he selected a father and son, um, and it's a sculptural piece, totally an installation. The father is in prison. In reality, the father is in prison. And Pepone goes and interviews the father many times, makes tapes, videos, and the son is interviewed as well. And he would bring the tape of the son to the father and show it to him, and the father would reply, and he would show it to him. So he built this piece where one room is the cell, a replica of the cell, and the other is a replica of this teenage boy's room. And on the wall is the father speaking to the son, and the son in the son's room, in the father's cell, the son is speaking to the father. It's heartbreaking. Finally, the father is allowed out of jail and goes back to selling drugs very quickly. So it is incredibly heartbreaking for everyone and following this story. What, you felt, what, he, what he was also talking about, unseen, was the burden that the mother carried. He's a sociologist, don't forget. The burden that the mother carries to see this family through and the stamina it takes for the boy not to end up like his father and, and, and why this happens in this community. He went it very deeply. So this is, is this a sociological experiment of a kind, but it's a fabulous sculpture and, and a great, great artwork. Um, and was anyone ready to buy this? No. Has anyone bought it as of today? No. Will they? I'm certain they will. But they will pay a high price. <laughs> I guarantee it. They will pay a high price. Um, and this is one of the works. There's many other installations of all kinds that he's made over a period of time. And all of a sudden, after this work, some years later, he gets a phone call. And the phone call was to tell him that he won a MacArthur Prize for his work. No one's bought his work, serious work like that. Now they're buying other pieces of his, they are. But some years ago, the MacArthur um, Committee gave him the uh, Genius Award. And so he, get, it also comes with insurance, how important that is. Health insurance for his entire family, he has two kids. And 
So it was a huge, huge help for him and a real boost for his career. And he's still making incredible work. I, was, I gave a radio interview this morning and I was trying to explain how someone can be a significant artist and yet be very undersold, underrepresented in collections. And, you know, Pepon's a great example. You've shown other artists, Leon Gala, Ida Applebrug, any number of people were going to, you know, come upon at some point where, um, you know, here's Christine Hill, a very intense, involved, elaborate project for uh, an art fair, very difficult to, to sell, very difficult to produce, but, but these are artists who are making contributions in ways that are it's hard the, to pin down exactly. The first show we did for Christine Hill, um, <laughs> she's a character, totally, and just brilliant. Um, she's in Germany. She works uh, um, as, as a professor um, in, in the um, biggest university there for art. And um, the piece that we first showed was uh, quite an amazing thing. Uh, we turned the gallery into a stadium. We had bleachers and you sat in them like the TV programs you watch, and she produced, right in front of you, a talk show. One night she produced a talk show. Who was she interviewing? People she found on the street. People she looked up that she thought might be interesting. And she brought them on, and they were all very interesting, incredible. And she was using the format of the nightly program for her to begin to explain what she does in the world. So it's not like Pepone really at all. It may sound a little bit like that. But what she's doing is she, um, first time I ever met her, uh, before we showed her, was at a documenter in Germany. You had to go under the street uh, in a tunnel, sort of a tunnel, very large, to get to the other side of the street. That was the best way not to get run over. And in that tunnel, there was a store, one store. And there I went in, and there was a woman, sort of very forceful and very dramatic and very smart, and she's selling products, the ugliest things you have ever seen. And they were clothes that she bought in local stores and hats and shoes and all kinds of trinkets and jewelry of various kinds, and you could buy it, and they all were stamped with something that said Volkspartik. That's, that's the folks, that's the, the, in German, it's, it's for folks. And folks has a very big history here. You can go back into the Nazi era, and you'll see what, how important the word folks, folks is. And she now was going to make this her brand. So it is her brand. She still makes it to this day. What you see here is her under the umbrella of Volks Boutique, um, a totally different change, however, at an art fair in New York. She is, all these posters are all over this whole stand. You're only seeing part of it. People would come, get in line, there were long lines, and they would talk with her and tell her their most intimate thoughts. She is so good at just talking to you quietly, and then you begin to tell her what's really bothering you, the real deal. She then tells you what you should do about it. Is she, is she trained? Absolutely not. So, but she, but she can do this, and she's fabulous at this, and, so she, and then she would prescribe for you, this was called pharmacy, we're already in a recession, and she's now, people are coming in with woes, or imagine they'd be much worse now, and all kinds of other problems, and she would cure them by telling people about it, and give you a bag, depending on how much you spent with her. Uh, there were prices, and never was too expensive. And she went into these big jars you see there, and she would put something in, and you wouldn't know what it was till you got home. And they were all different things. She went all over New York buying cheap things that were fantastic. And within a day or two, people would come back and they would get online again just to tell her that overnight or in two days, they definitely got over their problems. <laughs> and and, and, and it, would, it would make them wonder what it is that she's doing. So what is she doing? She's actually talking to and for people in, in, in the world as an artist and elevating all of that into artwork of all kinds of products. Uh, it's very complex, very complex. But again, you can see it's hard to know what to buy. We actually do sell this work in various ways, but it's, it takes a, some planning. I'm gonna move on here. Um, I stumbled into your gallery, I don't remember the first year that you showed Roxy, but for people who know Roxy Payne, you may have uh, read about or had the pleasure of seeing his installation on the roof of the Metropolitan this last summer. 
Um, this is a, a very typical work, stainless steel life-size tree. But the first work that you showed that I recall was elaborately crafted mushrooms that seem to have been emerging from <clears throat> your floor in the Soho Gallery, which is one of the, I mean, if, if floors can be legendary at galleries, this is a legendary wooden floor. Um, because you see, you know, years and years and decades of work on these floors and you start to have a sense of how they contribute to the nature of the artwork. This seemed like Roxy had just magically made these things happen. Can you talk about him as a young yes, artist you worked well, with? Ro Roxy was um, this uh, almost first generation of Brooklyn artists, all the artists, young, very young, living in Brooklyn. Um, and there were many and they were very talented. And um, Roxy's work caught my eye um, because it was changing all the time. It, it wasn't like he had a style that he was using and expanding in some ways, which is great. He wasn't doing that at all. And one day he came with, uh, to talk with me, and he had a book of drawings of all kinds of installations and things he wanted to make. They looked totally unrelated to each other, but each one was breathtakingly beautiful and very profound. And I thought first, well, this guy can't make all these things. This is crazy. And, um, no. So then I saw mushrooms that he did make, and they were amazing. And then he um, made one of these trees, uh, was put into Central Park during the Whitney Biennale, and it stood there for a while. And um, uh, the Times came and did, gave it a huge review. And I called the client th that morning and said, L Open the Times, take a look at this. This tree is going in your property soon. And they, and they said, What do you mean? I, they didn't see it. And they, they, later in the day, emailed me and said, this looks fantastic. We're driving to the city to see it. So I said, you have just a few hours. I want, but please, you have the place to put this. And they did. And, uh, and they bought it because it couldn't stay in the park. The park only had a limited permit. And so it's still there at their house. And it's absolutely beautiful. And um, birds sit on this tree as if it was a real tree. They just sit on there full, fully. Um, Roxy didn't want it lit at night. That was a big issue. But we didn't listen. And we did light it at night from below. And you get as much pleasure from night with that trees. It's just unbelievably beautiful to see it there. But what he was able to do is shape the trees, and particularly the ones on the roof of the museum recently, and other trees, in various states of their lifespans. And you can see when they're ill. You can see when they're dying. You can see when they've been somehow damaged. So the trees speak as if they're human, and they speak for nature. Um, yet they're totally made out of metal. Um, and. Uh, uh, there's many other things that Roxy uh, has done uh, over the years that are just astounding. So his little book, his diary, whatever's in there, I realized he could make it and he would make it. Kelly Heaton. Kelly Heaton is a strange case. She. Um... Are you sure? <laughs> Take a look. Okay. You can see this. Is a thing. So, what you're seeing here is an is an amazing thing. Um, Kelly Heaton was um, a graduate of Duke. She had just graduated, and uh, Duke found her to be such an incredible scientist that they kept her there in some special program so she could make special things and so on. And they gave her a place she also could make art and so on. I met her. Um, again, one of these people who you just speak to, and after a while you realize that whatever they're telling you, they really mean it. They're going to make this stuff. So you do have street smarts. I have three smarts, okay. yeah, I can just, just check. Well, and, and that would be worthwhile making. It's always a gamble. So what you're seeing here, to make it very short, is that one part of this piece, she went online and bought up Tickle Me Elmo's. Furbies, Tickled Me Elmo's, and whatever. And she, people would sell them to her for $25 with notes. They always came with notes. We love Jack, whatever the name of their animal was. And we love, we hate the part with, of course, she gave them $25, they parted with. So she knew that it was sort of not real, but everyone said they were very attached to them. She set up shop in the gallery, but in the, she had already done it before the gallery as well, where she slaughtered them. And she skinned them, like the old trappers and skinners who made, who trapped fur animals, real animals. And she took out the mechanisms inside them, uh, all, the, all the mechanics that worked. And then she sewed together all of these skins, furs, and so on, and she made this coat, okay? And inside the coat are all these wires that she had taken out from the uh, actual dolls. 
And a whole show revolved around this. It's very complicated. We would need hours just to explain the show and see it. So stay with this piece. And we had it in the gallery, and she made a little film. And you're seeing a still from the film where she became a fashionista. She wore the coat, and she walked up this fashion aisle uh, from end to end, and then she, and, and she stood there. And it was fantastically beautiful in the show. Everyone admired it. They were looking at it. And one day, I'm walking through the gallery. It had been up for maybe a week or two, and I'd heard the tape and seen it you know, dozens of times, and all of a sudden, I picked up the sound that I had heard, but it never quite got me. It was... And I turned around, I looked at her, and I said, she has become a suicide bomber. So that's what that piece is. She is the suicide bomber here. And she's made it from the little toys that children play with. And you could make it with all kinds of things. You could take it from boys working, let's say, with guns and every other thing. But she also made herself, and you can see, she's a target in many ways. And, and so on, she took the eyes, it's kind of fun but she basically blows up everyone who would be in this fashion show if she could. So she's really also making a statement about fashion, about things that are real but are not real, things that we put in as garments on ourselves. You can go on and on and on. So again, this is art. Um, everyone loves this. They love this piece. Has anyone bought it? Not yet. They will. Don't worry. We can, we can, I, I want to get to a couple of key things. We could go yeah. on to... Whatever you like. No, I mean, I'm just saying, it's, it, 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 I'm feeling the, the tug of time because we yeah. could talk for hours on Eleanor Anton. Um, what I think has been interesting, and we mentioned this earlier, is that Eleanor Anton, for people who, who don't know, is, you know, is one of the great feminist uh, conceptual artists in, you know, in the last 50 years. Um, you've done numerous shows with her. She's done a variety of different kinds of projects um, in performance, in photography, in objects. Um, but just looking at her, looking at Christine, looking at the, some of the other images, you have been involved with artists through a couple of different generations who one could say are united by the fact that they are very malleable in terms of being driven by ideas and where ideas lead them. You might not have had that as a, as a mission from the beginning, but it, it unites a lot of the artists that you've shown over the years. Can you talk a little bit about just ideas and, and this kind of art? I, I, I think I could say it, um, I can give the long version or the short version, I'll make it short. And um, there's two ways you could look at the work that you're seeing. Um, and one would be how beautiful it is aesthetically and make only an aesthetic judgment about it. And the second thing would be, what is its subject matter? I would prefer, if I had to error, I'd rather error on the subject part than the aesthetic part. In other words, you could make a mistake on the aesthetics, it's one thing, it's, it's okay. But I would never want to make a mistake on the idea part of it. On the, on, the, on the roots and the depth of what the work is. For me, that's the key ingredient. If the artist has that, they will get it right at the right time. And they can be off at certain times, but it doesn't matter. Um, so, I, so that's just a very broad general statement about what oh, I Oh, but I think, I, you know, I think coming through a period, you know, the sort of early years of your gallery were right smack in the middle of the heyday of conceptual art in a lot of ways, and so it's not surprising that, 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 that both you champion that kind of work and would make that kind of uh, position. It would be, we'd be remiss, we wanna, we wanna try to make sure that we talk about Comor and Malamud, Joseph Boyce, and um, okay. Hannah Wilkie. I think we'd Co be Co remiss. Comor and Malamud. Um, How did uh, you meet these guys? Tell us a little bit about Comor and Malamud. A cousin of Alexander Melamed's um, got out of Russia, basically thrown out of Russia. Um, he would sort of reveal how, how corrupt the regime was. And um, they went looking for him all the time to capture him, and he was like the Scarlet Pimpernel. Um, and he was hiding somewhere. Finally, they got him and they threw him out instead of killing him. So you could see things were slightly changing. But, so when he came to New York, someone sent him to see me. And um, he had the work of his cousin, Alex, and, and he was, Alex was working uh, with Vitaly Komar. And I looked at this work, and I was stunned by the 
clarity and beauty of this work and the subject matter. And the first thing that came into my mind was, we all thought in the West, art was dead in the Soviet Union. More terrible was that the artists were dead or in prison. And all of a sudden, here was this gorgeous golden work. Um, and that became very deep, meaning there were a, a group of artists there. And they were, it was larger than we thought. And they did, you may remember this, you may not, what was called the bulldozer exhibition. They had the courage, the guts, to actually get together in a park and show their work on a weekend. And it was bulldozed by the authorities. And that was a huge thing in our press. Now, that was led, among others, by Vitaly and Alex. The first work I saw that his cousin brought me was a photograph, which was just black and white photo. It was a sort of banal looking apartment building at night with a light in the window, a little flashlight. And on the street was a figure with a little flashlight. They were sending each other Morse code at night. That is as far as their span of influence could be safely. And what did they learn? They learned about pop art from Art Forum and other art magazines that were smuggled into the Soviet Union. Most of them could not read English. So pop art was transferred into the Soviet system and it became Sats art. And Sats art is now incredibly famous. And uh, many of the artists are also as famous. And Vitaly and Alex, you see here, one of the paintings that they're making is Stalin looking in the mirror. Stalin was also an officer in the military at one point. And here's Stalin looking at himself. And the style they chose to use is the accepted required style of socialist realism. Just like the Nazis had a style, the Soviets had a style. But of course they're taking great liberties with this. And so it's a send up of what their world was like. They're sending a message out now in paintings. The, many, many works were smuggled out. We were at one end of the line of the smuggling um, and we smuggled work in. What we smuggled in were old jeans, um, very cheap art books that were being remaindered someplace with lots of photos in them, um, condoms, lipstick, um, anything you could sell in the black market and get in, in volume, we sent in there. How did it get there? We would call a phone number to a, an organization that had some kind of name, um, and they, you would say, I have some work, could you please bring it to the Soviet Union? And they would say, bring it Wednesday at three. You would bring it, it always got delivered. We never knew how, um, but it always got to where it was going so they could eat and they could continue to make their work. There were a number of artists that we worked with that way, and uh, that gives you some idea. And they've gone on to make incredible works and, and, and very famous works. Ilya Kabakov is another artist like that, mm -hmm. and so on. This is Meryl Euclid. So this is hard to describe in, 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 in a lengthy thing. Meryl Euclid is home one day, taking care of her children. They're babies. She's doing diapers. She's washing clothes all the time. And she realized she was a maintenance worker. And she's also an artist. So she decided, who are the maintenance workers of the world? The sanitation department. She has become the artist in resident without salary at the Department of, um, of what is it? I don't know. The, the, the New York Department, Department of Sanitation. Sanitation. And she, so she is um, uh, uh, still working to this day there. And New York, lo and behold, can you imagine this dream for an artist, ends up with the largest landfill in the world of garbage in Staten Island. And she has gotten the right to work in there with other artists now have been added in. It's been a battle for years and years and years to get this done. And so they have capping this uh, site now. Um, and uh, she will make a piece there as well. She also scrubbed floors. You might have seen a photo like this in many books now. She's the most requested artist in our gallery for photos all over the world. Meryl Euclid, more than boys, more, more than Andy Warhol, uh, is Meryl Euclid. And um, um, so the world loves her work. You might have seen photos of sanitation trucks with mirrors on them. Mm -hmm. After the parades, where the city is filthy and they come and clean, what you see are these sanitation trucks. And if you're on the sidewalk, you see your face. You did it. 
<laughs> so she, but, but she's honoring the sanitation workers that their work as maintenance workers really matters. Uh, I could tell you many, many wonderful, wonderful stories about this. But she scrubbed the steps of the Hartford Athenaeum. It's become an icon work, iconic. And other artists do things like that. She scrubbed it with brushes and with her hair. And so when you talk, when, when, when you've had an artist like Janine Antoni come to Atlanta, or you've heard or read uh, people of her generation refer to older artists like Merle and Carolee Schneemann, this is the kind of trajectory. And so it's not always about you know, the sale, it's about the influence, it's about the legacy, it's about the, the, the sort of discourse. And so here is an artist many of you may never have heard of, and given the range of people that you show in your gallery for that photo request to be what it is, is, is both staggering and very <laughs> uh, encouraging <laughs> in a lot of ways. It is. Um, it, it's safe to say that one of the artists you've been most associated with in terms of uh, showing her work almost from, uh, very, and we'll go forward here. Let me just start here. I think you can stay there for yeah. the moment. Okay, so this is a Hannah Wilkie, and um, Hannah Wilkie is, um, an artist that I met in California, just totally luck. Um, she was living with Claus Oldenburg at that time, and um, Claus had a show in a California gallery. I went that night um, to say hello, and I heard somebody with a very, if you think I have a New York accent, Hannah has Damon Runyon's uh, New York accent, and I heard someone she's sort of like chewing gum in an old mink coat, uh, second hand for sure, I turn around and see her because she's talking to somebody, and I said, if ever there was someone you could say, that's a dame, that's a dame, from Dun B B Damon Runyon. But beautiful, absolutely beautiful person. And um, then I start to talk to her. I also think she must be stupid because I'm hearing her talking, she's wearing this coat. And I, then I'm talking to her and I'm saying, this person's not stupid. This person's incredibly intelligent. She's saying incredible things. And she says, would you like to come and see my work? She's like, would you like to come up and see my etchings? So I said, yes, I would like to. And uh, when we went back to New York, I did go to see her. She had a studio within Claus's studio. And uh, there she had on the floor um, uh, boards, and she was pouring latex. And the latex was drying. It's not a healthy thing to do. And um, she was then taking these large sections and putting in snaps, snapping them together, and hanging them on the wall, making huge vaginal images and stopped in my tracks. This was quite amazing. The, the ones I saw were like light pink, and they were breathtakingly beautiful. And I thought, whoa, this is amazing. At that time, Claus, um, I knew this work quite well, Claus was making work that was very well accepted, of all kinds of things. We're making drawings where women serviced men. They were very erotic, whatever, but women were servicing men. I'm in this studio with Anna, and Hannah is in charge. She's not servicing anybody. Hannah is making the images that she wants. And she, I then was talking about that. And what she wanted was not to be better than a man, not to be better than anyone else. She wanted to be equal to anyone and in art history, which she knew cold. And she was going to make these images and women's bodies to her body, artworks and performance works and so on. So what you're seeing here is one of those. With, with sculptures all around her. The first show, um, my mother came to see it. She wanted to help me sell art and feed my kids who were coming along. And um, she brought some of her friends. And um, on the way out, she put her head in my office and she said, you know, dear, I don't think I'm gonna be able to help you. <laughs> so that was, um, that was the beginning of my, my career with Hannah. And um, uh, she went on to do incredible things. Mrs. Butter was, uh, was H Hannah's name was Butter, a maiden name. And uh, Mrs. Butter was a wonderful mother. And one day she came to uh, an opening of Hannah's. And um, she was there for several hours. She came a little early. And we're chatting and chatting. And uh, finally, it's the time for the evening's events. And Hannah's in there. And uh, Hannah says to me, people feel that I might do a performance tonight. They were ad lib sometimes and I, I, that I'm gonna strip, but I'm not going to strip tonight. I don't want to, I want them to look at my show in a different way. She had these beautiful big latex pieces up. 
So I went in and said to Mrs. Butter, Mrs. Butter, Hannah is not going to strip tonight. She goes, ah, I'll go home now. <laughs> so the idea behind this was that she didn't want anyone to think that she didn't support what her daughter was doing. The piece you see before was Hannah photographing her mother when she had breast cancer. So Hannah is still beautiful, and her mother is not. You could not have predicted then that Hannah, some years later, was going to come down with lymphoma, slow growing, and that she was going to die from it. So what happened was somebody who was accused over and over again narcissist. for being a narcissist just let her life still roll on as she always had and made her work that way. And you saw her in every stage of this illness. And she made herself living sculptures during that time. She played roles. She made beautiful art drawings from these periods and so on. It was an amazing work. So she went from being an angel, which she had drawn for the Museum of Modern Art, herself as an angel for holiday cards. All of a sudden, she was now a patient of a kind. She never gave in to this disease, not ever. And her work at the end, this whole cycle of work, full-scale human size, photographs of her getting through this illness. And a lot of them fun. Uh, she just went right at it completely. Um, has become part of, uh, uh, part of the art canon, I think, at this point. Yeah, I mean, that, for people who know that work, that was certainly one of the most amazing exhibitions I've ever seen anywhere happen to be here. And it, it reminds me of another statement that you make in that book, saying the best, ga you know, uh, the best galleries in the world are really contemporary museums, only self-funded. Yes, they are. And in that sense, to be able to have the interest, capacity, circumstances to present work that is so fearless. I mean, the, the work we're, we're talking about is just unbelievable. Um, we're going to go over slightly today. I'm warning you right now because it's going to be impossible. Um, there isn't not, that much. Or not, not. No. But um, let's, you know. OK, so, so just, Chris Burden, OK, you can see this is not easy. Unless you want a Volkswagen with a crucified figure on it, it's hard to want to buy it. Um, so Chris Burden did this. Um, a lot of this work was during the Vietnam War when we first met him. And so he had himself shot in the arm as well. And of course, all the critics were saying, and uh, even on radio programs, they said, oh, today an artist shot himself. And everyone would go, oh, that guy's crazy. What it was was a mirror, a mirror. Every night at that time in, in American history. Mm -hmm. When we went to bed at night, there was always a helicopter, airlifting, wounded American, uh, militaries, um, uh, army, navy, personnel off of the battlefield with plasma hanging on their bodies. So Chris had himself shot in the arm, only to be wounded. It went a little further in. Made sure it was a very small gauge bullet. And he did, he did that piece. Uh, it was called Shoot. Um, and uh, it's still an amazing piece. Um, as to mirror our society, here he's doing a piece, uh, another kind of religious scene, and so forth. Um, I met him uh, in New York uh, because he was doing a piece that I'd already heard of him and studied a little bit about him. And a friend of his, I met a friend of his, and I said, could you just put me in touch with Chris Burden? I want to talk with him. And where was he? He was on an elevator um, in a loft in Soho, having people push push pins into his body. Um, and he did come to see me without the push pins. Um, and I realized that he was absolutely brilliant and that he was really the mirror uh, of his time, without question. He went on to do many performance pieces, but then also started to make sculptures and other objects and so on. Um, and it was very hard to sell and so forth, uh, without question. But in the first show, the buyers were included Jasper Johns and Andy Warhol and some critics. <laughs> who, they were the only ones who recognized what Chris Burden was doing, and they wanted to own that work and support him. Uh, that's happened to us a few times over the years. We're going to wind up. Oh, let me go the other way. Oh, on, sorry. We're going to wind up. We're looking at an image of Joseph Boyce as opposed to necessarily a work. What can you tell us about this person that we might not know? I mean, many people in the audience okay. might know Boyce's work to varying degrees. It would be difficult to unpack the entirety of his contribution. But what would be something that, that we don't know about Boyce? By this time in our conversation tonight, you'll, you'll understand that this is, we were a good place for Joseph Boyce. Um, uh, Joseph Boyce's work I first encountered in a trip to Europe. It was in the Basel Museum and um, uh, on the first floor. You always went there when you went to the Basel Art Fair. You would go to the Basel Museum, and they had all these great treasures. 
and uh, you make your way up or down the steps. And in the in downstairs on the ground floor, there was a big room full of sculptures, incredible sculptures in vitrines. They look like Picasso's very early Cubist sculptures, but they weren't Cubist at all. It's just that they had small images and all kinds of sculptures in them. I was floored by them. They were breathtakingly beautiful. They looked dirty. They looked like maybe junk in a certain way, but they were incredibly important. I was positive. I didn't know how to pronounce his name, so I never pronounced it. And a few days later, I was at my first documenta in, in Germany, in Frankfurt. And we had one artist in that show, or two artists. I think we only were showing two artists in New York at the time. And they were both in this documenta. And um, all of a sudden, I hear in, in an entrance hall, where we're all busy talking and installing work, or getting instructions how to install works, someone says, there's boys. And I realized it wasn't buoys or buys or whatever, it was boys. And that I said, oh, that's him. So I went over to talk with him. His English was not good. My German was virtually non-existent. And um, we're trying to talk. And I'm talking about democracy and things like this. And he's talking about democracy in some other way, God knows. And all, then all of a sudden, like a hyena, he goes, <laughs> like that, just like that. Uh, my heart stops. I'm looking at this crazy man. And I thought, oh, my God. God, what is this about? And he was doing a piece. We were doing a piece together. That's what we were doing in this lobby. Everybody stopped. Everyone was looking at this thing. Um, to make a very long story short, we became very good friends. Um, and um, he came to the United States uh, for basically the first time for, for a real trip. Um, and um, then we worked and we did a huge Guggenheim show. We showed his work in the gallery and so on. Now, what is this work about? He comes about after World War II. So World War II is ending. He was in an airplane then. He was either, um, wasn't the pilot. Uh, he either was a, a gunner in this plane or he was something that he did mechanically in the plane. The plane is shot down. It's uh, in, in the Caucasus and a mythical story arises that Boyce tells. He's found by Tartars. He's dying. They put fat on his body to heal his wounds, which were many. He also still had a plate in his head all his life after that. And they wrap him in felt. And now felt becomes his working material. And felt is made into all kinds of beautiful images, unbelievable. And he does these very strange performances, holding a dead rabbit on his lap and telling you, this, telling stories to the rabbit. 